This week, this week, excuse me. This week we're going to be in Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. Now we noticed last week about the blessings that Isaac gave to Jacob and Esau. And we pick up in Genesis 28, continuing where we last left off in Genesis 27, where that it was stated that Rebekah was worried about Jacob taking wives of the daughters of Canaan. And so we pick up in verse 1, says, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Pedanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Once again, we find the concept of marrying within your own nation stated here in the Old Testament. One cannot understate the importance of marrying someone who shares your same values. I can state from experience that if not for our shared values, then a marriage to Brittany would be far rougher and the hurdles that we would have to overcome would be that much harder to overcome. Now Isaac understood this and he wanted his sons to follow in his wisdom. He wanted his sons to follow in his wisdom. Now Esau already has, he's pretty much gone on his own way. He married women of the Canaanites. He sold his birthright. And then here's this thing that happened about the blessings that we just noticed last week. It's just one thing after another with Esau. But it's not too late for Jacob. Isaac wants Jacob to, since, especially since now that Jacob has gotten the Abrahamic promise, he wants him to follow in marrying someone who has the same values, who shares the same values. There is great wisdom in selecting someone who shares your same values for a spouse. It keeps you centered. It keeps you on the right direction. It also gives you a good foundation on which to handle conflict that does arise. You're more liable to work as a team rather than to pull apart when times get rough. And it especially helps in child rearing to form a solid unit when you and your spouse are on the same page. Again, getting on into verse 3, it says, And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. Now you see, we just noticed that Jacob is the son that received the Abrahamic promise. And it is his line that would inherit the promised land. It was his line that would go into Egypt and live in bondage for 400 years, but would, would become the nation of Israel after God would release them from bondage. It is his line that Judah would be born. And it is in the line of Judah that the Messiah would come. It is his line, Jacob's line, that would become the great nation. In verse 5 it says, Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Pedanaram unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, 
Jacob and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pedanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and mother and was gone to Pedanaram. And Esau, seeing the daughters of, the, of Canaan, pleased not Isaac his father. Then Esau, then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, Mahalath the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. Now to understand what's going on here, Esau saw what happened. He got he caught wind. He knew what happened with Jacob. And so he's going to get an idea in his head because he saw that the Canaanite women did not please his father. They weren't the kind of women that his parents wanted him to have for wives. And so he gets this idea and he said he goes to a distant relative to the daughters of Ishmael and took wives of them. So you see, this is his way of still being rebellious. This was him trying to please his parents enough to try to get the will of Isaac to get that blessing that was given to Jacob revoked. He's still trying now he's trying to weasel his way. <clears throat> he's trying to weasel his way. And where we have to really pay attention to what is being said here <clears throat> is under the premise that he was doing the right thing, but he was doing it for the wrong reasons. If you do the right thing for the wrong reasons, then you're just as wrong as doing the wrong thing for the wrong reasons. Or even the wrong thing for the right reasons. brings to mind John 4.24 where it says that God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. This means you, in spirit means you have to have the right attitude in worshiping God, but you have to worship Him in truth as well. That means you have to follow what He said do, to do in worship. You're not just able to go willy-nilly and do whatever you want. And let's take for let's take for example. Now I, I I could go into the thing about singing. I could go into the thing about singing. But let's look at something a little bit different now. Let, let's look about the Lord's Supper. If you go up and look about the passages about the Lord's Supper in the New Testament, you find that there are two things that are there on the Lord's Supper. There are two elements on the Lord's Supper. There is the bread that represents the body of Christ, and you have the fruit of the vine. That represents his blood. It doesn't say anything about Coca-Colas and hamburgers and pizza. It doesn't say anything about those other foods. And that's the point. Is it doesn't say anything about those other foods. Does that sound like a very similar argument that people use about instrumental music? God didn't say not to. We're not authorized to have all these different foods. It's not a buffet. It is a memorial service, the Lord's Supper is. Observing about the death of Christ. And we observe it until He comes. He said, this do in remembrance of me. And so, if we are not in the right attitude when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're wrong in taking it. If we add anything or take anything away from the Lord's Supper, then we're wrong when we take it. But then in doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, we can also be wrong. If we partake of the Lord's Supper... 
because we just do it every Sunday, because it's a tradition that we just constantly do. That we do it because we've always done it. Now I want everybody to pay very close attention to what I'm saying right now, because if you don't pay attention, you're liable to get upset. If we do something simply because we have always done it, then that's wrong. If we do anything, it has to be. It has to be authorized by the Word of God. It has to be authorized in this book right here. Otherwise, you lose the whole meaning behind doing it. Same thing with music. Same thing with music. There are songs, and I've made this point before too, and I get a, I get a, a chance to make it right now on film. And I actually had a song leader slam his songbook, get up and leave out of the building when I made this point. But, uh, give me a songbook. There are songs and songbook that they they sound pretty. We love singing them. They have that old country twang to it, but they're unscriptural. They're they're unscriptural. I want everyone to notice, incidentally, and I, and I I love the way that this is numbered because uh because of Revelation. Song number 666. Everyone know the song 666. Mark of the Beast there. Very interesting that this song actually is here. The title of this song is Jesus is Coming Soon. I've heard this song in countless congregations. Just about every congregation that I've been to, I've heard this song sung. And people sing it because it sounds pretty. But let's look at what it's saying. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians await. Uh, love of so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. When all has come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast, trumpets will sound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore, when we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling the world goodbye, homeward we then will fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound, all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Now, we have to ask a very, very important question here. It says Jesus is coming soon. How do they know that He's coming soon? How do they know that He's coming soon? Last time I checked it, we don't know what day or hour that the Lord will come. And notice what the whole premise of the song is saying. It's saying that we know that Jesus is coming soon because of troublesome times being here. Talking about signs of the times. Last time I checked, we don't know that there's not going to be any signs. That it's just going to happen. Troublesome times being here is no indication of the hastening of the coming of the Lord. In fact, that song is an older song and it talks about troublesome times being here. What about back in Rome when Christians were being, being taken from their homes, being crucified, being put in the arena to fight lions, being dipped in oil and hung up on the city streets? Is that a bad time? Is that a troublesome time? And that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. That happened in the first century. And what I find so ironic about this whole situation at this point in time is back in the first century, you have this going on and you have a group of Christians that Peter addresses in one of his letters 
that they were saying the Lord's not coming back because He hasn't come back yet. And then 2,000 years later, we don't even know the beginning. There's a song written probably about 50 years ago that they, did, they weren't even seeing troublesome times compared to the first century, and yet they say that they know He's coming back because troublesome times are here. That is so ironic. That is so ironic. But there are songs, in, the point is that there are songs in the songbook, they sound pretty, but they teach false doctrine. If we, and yet it's sung at congregations all the time. And when you ask about it, why do you sing that song? Well, we've always sung it. We've got to pay attention to what we do and why that we do it. Here's Esau, who he, he goes to Ishmael. Now, let's pay very close attention about going to Ishmael because when we last left off, Ishmael really didn't... Ishmael really didn't share the same values as Isaac. In fact, the whole reason why that Hagar and Ishmael were sent away and driven away from the presence of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac is because that Ishmael was persecuting his younger half-brother. He was persecuting him. He was tormenting him. Does that sound like they, he had shared the same values? And the last time that we really see, hear about him as he comes back into the picture long enough to help bury Abraham. And then he's gone again. And so Esau, he's getting this bright idea. He's going to try and get this blessing revoked by going to Ishmael to get a wife. To get wives. Thinking that's marrying within his own nation. do the right and he it's not even really the right thing but if you do the right thing for the wrong reason you're wrong that's why motivation is such a big factor that's why motivation is such a big factor and, and I and I tell you I don't have to point fingers at any one particular person. I don't have to say anything about any one particular person. I don't have to name any names. I can expose people just by preaching a sermon like this. How? All you have to do is watch for their reactions. All you have to do is watch for their reactions. All I have to do is get up and say that we have to watch our motivations. We have to have the right motivation. We have to do the right thing for the right reason. Because if we do the right thing for the wrong reason, then we're just as wrong as doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And if I say that, then people get all upset and everything. You watch the person that gets upset. I just stepped on their toes. There's a, a saying that I I know I heard it from my mother, and I know I heard it from my grandmother. I don't know where exactly they got it from, but it's the thing of uh, the hit dog guilt. And what they're saying is, and I have full experience in this. There's a pack of there was a pack of wild dogs in our neighborhood a while back. They were dangerous to people walking and to children. They were a nuisance. They were a pest. They were turning over garbage cans, making a mess out of everybody's yard. Everybody was complaining about it. Animal control wouldn't do anything about it. And so I sat out one morning with my BB gun. 
And while I may not be the best shot in the world, I am a pretty good shot when I do hit what I'm aiming at. And I pop one of them, to, and there's the whole pack of them, and I pop one of them in the, on, the, on the back hip. And it was a little spring BB gun, a little red rider, so it was enough to, it was like a bee sting. It was enough to sting, not enough to do any permanent damage. But I tell you, I hit that one on his back leg. When they were turning over everybody's garbage cans and stuff, that was the dog that yelped, but the whole pack of them went running. The hit dog is the one that yelps. All I have to do is preach a sermon like this. And the one who gets the toe stepped on is the one that gets angry. They're the ones that you find after, after the sermon's delivered, getting all up. That was mean-spirited. You don't need to be preaching stuff like that. We have to watch our motivations. Going on into verse 10, it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This is the dream about Jacob's ladder. And behold, there's verse 13, The Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. You know, God gives the prom no, this is God giving the promise. This is not just Isaac passing things down. This is God giving the promise He gave to Abraham, that, and that He gave to, Jacob, to Isaac. Now He's giving it to Jacob. And thus now we know where the saying comes from, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was during this period of being that Jacob was alone. He was fleeing for his life. And it was during this period of isolation that God instructed him. We remember back in Genesis when we first started where it said that it is not good that man should be alone. Now while it's not good for man to always be alone, there is a time of solitude that can have its merits. Sometimes when we are alone, it allows time for meditation upon God's Word. Uninterrupted meditation. So when we are alone, sometimes it allows us to reflect on our own past on our present circumstances, and it can help us more. It can help us in clearly see, and well, excuse me, and more clearly seeing the path that God wants us to take. Because when you are alone, you can be away from the voices of influence of others. Sometimes solitude can have its merits. It was here that God was instructing Isaac. Not Isaac, but Jacob. Excuse me. It was here that He was instructing Jacob. Now we know that Jacob, his name would later be changed to Israel. Jacob awoke, awaked out of his sleep. This is verse 16. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 
And Jacob rose up early in the morning, took of the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. Now he awoke with reverential fear. This is that word fearful that we were talking about earlier in Bible class. This is full of reverence, full of respect for God. And notice he set up a pillar. Now he didn't build an altar, but the pillar here was set, it was a pillar that was like a stone, a memorial stone. And he poured oil on top of it. He consecrated it. He called the name of the place, verse 19, Bethel. We often see that name here, the Bethel Springs. Uh, there's a, a denomination out on the highway someplace, that, but Bethel something church. We, the word Bethel means house of God. Now notice it says, but the name of the city was called Luz at first. So the name was changed. Jacob changed the name of the city from Luz to Bethel. Just as God will change Jacob's name <coughs> to Israel. Verse 20, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all of that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now we have to understand something real quick in looking at this. We have to understand something about this. When he said, if God will be with me, then I'll do this. Yes, it, he, it is an if-then thing, but this is not a conditional bargaining chip. This is not a bargaining thing with God. God has just told Jacob what he would do. And Jacob says, you say you're going to do that? Tell you. I'm going to put my trust in you. And I'm going to let you do what you said you're going to do. And in return, I'm going to follow you and not go after false gods. It's not a bargaining thing. It's an understanding. It's a mutual respect. A mutual understanding. God set it up 2,000 years ago. Now, His plan was in the works long before, but the plan came to completion nearly 2,000 years ago with a plan of salvation. You know, we have to hear the gospel, of course, Romans 10, 17. We have to believe that the message, we have to believe that Jesus is who He said He is. John 8, 24. We have to repent of our sins, Acts 17, 30. We have to confess Him before others, Romans 10, 9, and 10. We have to be baptized, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And we have to live faithfully. Now God said, if we do that, if we follow what He said to do, then we be saved. We will have a home with Him in heaven. Now we already know that what God said is true. And we already know that God holds all the cards. But then it's like, okay, God, you promised to do this. I'm going to trust you. And if you keep your word, then you don't have to worry about me straying. And it's not a bargaining thing. It's an understanding that God has told us that if we meet these conditions, then He will do this. It's putting your trust in God. 
For Him to never steer you wrong. For Him to do what He said He's going to do. And it's about surrendering. It's surrendering our lives to Christ. Just as Jacob surrendered his life to God back here in Genesis 28. And when we surrender our lives to Christ, then we can obtain salvation. And if anyone has need to respond to the Lord's invitation to meet the conditions of salvation, to be saved, or if someone has strayed from the path and they need to repent and ask for forgiveness, as Simon was known as the sorcerer did in Acts 8.22, then we plead with you, we encourage you to do what you need to do and get right with God before it's everlastingly too late. If anyone has need to respond, please do so while the rest of us stand and sing.